Well, welcome everybody. We're recording and I'd like to welcome everybody to another one of my YouTube uh, webinar interviews. Uh, once again today, um, quite uh, quite unexpectedly, since I don't deserve it, I have uh, two great guests, one you've seen before, one you have not. And the guest of honor today is, uh, is Dr. Margaret Turek. Uh, she is professor of theology and chair of dogmatic theology at St. Patrick's Seminary and University. Uh, she also received her doctorate in sacred theology at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland, the Schweiz. And uh, she's also authored a book called Towards a Theology of God the Father. I say also because what we're going to be work looking at today is this book here. It's her latest book. It's just called it's a book on the atonement, a, a, an extremely important topic. This book is making, I think, quite a splash and uh, deservedly so. Um, it's really making the rounds, uh, at least in the circles that I move in. I think the most important thing that you should notice about the book is that if you turn it to the back and go to the very bottom, you will see that I have endorsed it. And I think that I, I place great significance in the fact that my name is last. Uh, I'm just not certain I know what, whether that means I have the last word, or hopefully the nobody, last shall be first. The last nobody, shall be first, yes, Larry. I, exactly, exactly. It'll be made. It'll be made up for in heaven. Don't worry. I, I don't know who these other endorsers are: Rose <laughs> Harris, <laughs> Nicholas Healy, uh, James Keating, Khalid Anatolia, Samir Degal. Who are these nobodies? Pay attention to that last one. That's I, I give it my full-throated endorsement. <laughs> so, all joking aside, great book, Margaret. Uh, I am very thrilled to have you on the show today to talk about this topic. And the other guest, of course, you, many of my viewers have seen before, Dr. Adrian Walker, who is also professor of theology at uh, St. Patrick's Seminary there at Menlo Park, which is close to San Francisco. I've known Adrian since he was a wee lad uh, <laughs> when we were both when we were both young and handsome. And uh, well, at least I, I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. You're still... You're st you're still young, Larry. Adri Adrian taught at the uh, John Paul II Institute for Studies of Marriage and Family in Washington, D.C. Also taught at Catholic University of America. He is, uh, in the past, he's been an editor at the journal Communio. He's written numerous articles. He is a translator extraordinaire. Uh, I am jealous of his linguistic abilities. Oh, he's a polyglot, nice. of, <clears throat> polyglot of genius levels. Um, I can barely speak English, and I remember suffering through reading yes. Balthazar in German for my dissertation. Thank you, the late Ed Oaks. God bless you, Ed, for making me read Balthazar in German. Uh, but I think I would have rather gouged out my eyes with knitting needles <laughs> than have to translate <laughs> Balthazar's German one more time. Uh, so uh, thank you for all of your efforts in translation, Rodney, for making yeah. my life easier and for saving my eyesight. <laughs> so uh, there we go. All right. So let's get started here. All, all jokes aside, I'm going to um, and hopefully Rodney, uh, Rodney, I'm going to probably do that 10 times. Our colleague, my colleague, Rodney Hauser, a former colleague, is on vacation in Florida. Otherwise, he would be joining us. We actually tried to do this a week ago and the Internet gods were not smiling on us and Rodney was with us. So we decided to do it with just three people rather than four. <laughs> anyway, um, so Adrian, just jump in and interject your, your expertise, your questions at, at any moment. In fact, mm -hmm. I'll probably turn to you soon uh, for sure. commentary. But I'm going to begin, obviously, with uh, Dr. Turek, uh, because she is the, the guest of honor. You, you, you title the book Atonement, so obviously it's a mm -hmm. book on the theology of the atonement. Uh, for my viewers, I, if you don't mind, and I don't want to put, put you on the spot, do, do two things here right up front initially. Define what theology of atonement means. What, what, it, what do we mean when we use the word atonement, if that's not an overly complex question uh, already from the get-go? And, and number, number two, why did you feel there was a need to write a book on atonement? All right. Well... I can answer the second one kind of facetiously by saying that you can define atonement so <laughs> very briefly, and it required an entire book to do so. I was afraid you were going to say that. Yes, yes. But I will, I admit this early on in my book, I admit that we begin with a fairly general uh, notion of atonement um, as a way of eliminating sin, a way of eliminating sin. 
Um, sometimes it, it's regarded as a, sort of a way of making right that which went wrong. Um, there are synonyms uh, for atonement uh, everywhere in my book and in the writings of my four theological guides. Atonement is sometimes understood or, or simply expressed in terms of uh, satisfaction, expiation, reparation. Uh, sometimes I've seen atonement explained in terms of its outcome um, or its goal, at one minute, uh, yeah. in, at one minute. But in, yeah. in, in my text, uh, in my text, first of all, I am not aiming to standardize theological vocabulary um, with reference right. to my text. Okay. It's it's more about the, to my mind, atonement is a, a work, of course, and a work of love, indeed a work of filial love. As filial love, it is engendered love, uh, a love engendered by another such that this modality of love mirrors its generative source. Uh, so in my book, I spend an awful lot of time, cover um, an great amount of pages in spelling out or tracing out the profoundly interpersonal quality or character of this work of atonement. Uh, it, as I said, again, it's a work of filial love, but to recognize this work, not only as love, but filial love means you have to widen your frame of reference always to include the paternal mode, the initiating mode, the generative mode, and archetypal mode of the love that we find over here as filial, okay, and the one bearing sin. So, um, oh gosh, there's, there's already so much, so much to unpack in there. Um, obviously, I, I neglected to mention that you do take uh, four theologians as your sort of yes. your spirit guides <laughs> through yeah. the book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hans Urs von Balthasar, Pope John Paul II, Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, and Norbert Hoffman. Okay, so we're, I'm going to come back to, to later asking you to, to why you chose those four authors. But something that you just said uh, st struck me and, and leapt out at me immediately, which is the word sin. Because obviously, atonement theology has something to do with, yes, yes, with yes, sin. Yes. Yes. And I've always believed that atonement theology has sort of fallen on hard times in the modern world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in direct proportion and ratio to the concept of sin mm -hmm. has fallen on hard times yes. in the modern yes. world. Yes. So, yes. So to get back to your your um, second, I think, of your first two questions, why did I write this book? Why yeah. did I regard there uh, remained a need for this book? Um, and it has to do with the fact that I did notice uh, over the course of the last several decades um, uh, and a reticence, um, even a, an embarrassment mm -hmm. among theologians and preachers uh, to speak of the cross event as a work of atonement. Uh, so that was one of, of the reasons that I stepped up and wrote this book um, to overcome the, the reticence of, and especially, I'm going to say this, Larry, and I'm sure Adrian will agree with me here. Um, I wrote this book to my students. I mean, it, the dedication is to my students, and I mean that also in very practical terms. This book is the outcome of um, many years of teaching Christology mm -hmm. and soteriology to seminarians. And so my aim was to prepare them to be able to break open right. the, the biblical testimony, the sacred scriptures, precisely with respect to this mystery. I wanted no more of the dodging and the evasive moves on the part of priests and, and deacons. Uh, at the pulpit, even on Good Friday, who, who do these um, incredible linguistic uh, sort of gymnastics in avoiding 
uh, the very subject of atonement. I wanted my ma- my guys, I wanted them as priests to, to embrace this topic and to feel comfortable, if, if also in awe yeah, of, yeah. Of, of the mystery. And in bringing it to light and bringing it to light in such a way that what is mostly brought to light is the love of God that is both the Alpha and the Omega of, of the work of atonement. The love of God as Father, as Son, and as Holy Spirit that that is at the very core of and is being glorified through this work of atonement. So it's a very God-centered book. As much as it's focusing on sin, it, it, it never gives sin... Um, what should I say? Never let sin sort of monopolize our attention. From beginning to end, it's fixed on this the glory of the triune God, this God who is love. And it's one of the reasons I chose the four guides that I did, because these four theologians, they plant themselves at the foot of the cross, and they take a contemplative approach to their biblical theology. They illumine this mystery of atonement against the uh, horizon of the historical covenants, the history of salvation, as well as against the eternal, the horizon of the eternal trinity. So these guys always keep in view the fact that this is ultimately a work a work of God for us to the glory of God. And of course, right, to, right. to our beatitude. Now, a- Adrian, what are you thinking? You, you can, as you hear me, I'm sure you're able to realize, oh, she did, she leapt over that oh, God, particular don't, idea. Don't and that. and, that's not, that's well, not. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So. No, I mean, yes. the thing is, well, I mean, Margaret, you, you know, from, from our many conversations that I'm a, I really believe in this book and and I mean I've learned a lot from it. In fact, I, I I think it's the best account of the atonement out there, at least. I agree. Thing, I right? agree. Yeah. And uh so for me it's it's a it's not a question of, of um completing anything or correcting anything, much less uh it's it's much more a question of of just being inspired, you know. Um but I was just thinking, sort of again, in 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 the sense of being inspired rather than of of, of correcting anything, that uh, a doctrine of atonement has to be God centered. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Because, <clears throat> uh, insofar as it's about saving us, um, uh, it it might seem sort of to be centered on us, mm-hmm. but our salvation has to do with being reconciled to God. Yes. And uh, so there's a kind of God-centeredness, oh, yes. primary God-centeredness yes. to the doctrine of the atonement, yes. which again is about a sort of reconciliation with God. And then, and then as you say, I mean, in sort of, in saving us, <clears throat> God uses the thing that um, seems to, I mean, you know, the, the worst possible yes. thing, right, which is sin, um, not only to save us from the dominion of sin, right, he takes on sin, and in doing that destroys the dominion of sin over us, but in doing that, as you say, manifests God's yes. glory, so it, it, it has to be... That's it. It has to be God centered. And in fact, that's probably yes. that's one that's yes. probably one of the reasons for the eclipse of the doctrine of the atonement is the yes. eclipse of a kind of theocentrism in our thinking yes. of Christians. You know? Yes, yes. And just as a footnote, um, as I listen to you, Adrian, I would add that uh, when it comes to, say, just even Balthasar scholarship. Right. The, the sixth volume of Glory of the Lord has been relatively ignored and overlooked. Right. It, right. True. And w- one of the, I think, the um, benefits of my book, what can be gained from reading it for a Balthasarian scholar, 
is that I I comb through his yeah. biblical theology and bring yeah. out the very best of his biblical theology of the old covenant in the yeah. context yes. of of the glory of God yeah. initially before you even get into the theodramatics. Yeah, the, the, the important theme of the glory of God, and he deals Absolutely. with that theme with respect to the old covenant in volume six. Yeah, and and, and uh, I do, mm-hmm. and and I do think. So, sorry, Larry. I mean, just. Oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, R- Margaret, I think that that your book is also just indispensable reading for anybody who wants to understand what Balthazar and and sort of like minded theologians. I mean, you there, there are three like minded theologians who flank Balthazar in your book. Um, anybody who wants to understand what Balthazar and company are, are actually up to um, and who wants also to understand how even even some of the the kind of um, statements that that might seem a bit jarring at first are actually uh, profoundly beautiful and compelling uh, that yes. that person needs to read your book because I, 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 I can't think of a better kind of introduction to it's not simply about Balthazar obviously but he no, plays a role no. and the, the sort of Balthazarian way of of thinking about the atonement, I, I think, is laid out in your book in a way that any serious person of any school, ha- yeah, would would benefit from and sort of has to take seriously. I I would also add that these four theologians, I call them, you know, my group of four or, or my quartet, they are all in harmony on on the most significant. Uh, Do you issues name them, Margaret? I don't think we named them. Yeah. I, I, I named them. Yeah. Yes. Oh, did you name them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry, Larry. Well, that's okay. Go ahead and repeat them. Margaret. Okay. So John Paul II, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, Hans Urs von Balthasar, and Norbert Hoffman. It's the, the last gentleman named, Norbert Hoffman, uh, who is the uh, least known uh, right. among the four. And here I'll, I'll just simply... Um, uh, provide a very brief um, biographical bit of information. And I bet you, Adrian, might be able to add a bit more details about Father Hoffman. Not really. I don't, I don't know much about him, yeah, frankly. All, yeah. I, all I know is that he um, was a German uh, theologian and priest, uh, so a diocesan priest who taught at the university level and especially during the 1980s, produced a few very important works on this subject. Mm -hmm. Uh, One book entitled Atonement, another Cross and Trinity. And from those two major works, he uh, spun off um, multiple articles. Uh, and he admits that he was very much under the influence of Balthasar, even as he sets out to improve upon or sure. further further develop right. or or massage, sort of tone down <laughs> some some uh, areas of of Balthasar's own uh, theology of atonement. Yeah, one of the mm-hmm. things I really appreciated along the did, by, by the way, didn't Norm Hoffman Hoffman didn't he have an article or two in Communio? Absolutely, he did. Yeah, yeah. And so when I was f- first opening your book, and I saw that he was one of your guides, uh, I didn't go rushing to my Communio index, but there was a little bird chirping in my head. Yes. Like, okay, I think I remember reading something from yes. that guy years and years ago. Uh, so I w- but I was surprised. It's like wow. JP two Benedict Balthazar Hoffman and I uh, but but mm-hmm. he's, he's he's fantastic he he's is fantastic fantastic so when, th- go ahead and uh, his uh, of of special value to his um, theology is that unlike the the two popes well even uh, Benedict when he was merely Ratzinger uh, still had to be prefect uh, of the congregation for the doctrine yeah. of the faith. So you've got JP two and, and, uh, Benedict basically having to devote so much of their time and attention, um, to their, their ecclesiastical positions, basically. Um, and Balthasar had a much, uh, wider project. It was, it was Hoffman who could drill down deeply 
for a long period of time and concentrate his attention on this mystery. And that's why he is a worthwhile uh, source. Absolutely. I just, uh, I, I, I remember greatly appreciating the article um, that I read. I don't remember a lot of specifics about it, but I remember it. I, but I want to go back to the, to something from my own background and experience and why, one of the reasons why I, I so appreciated your book. Uh, when I was in the seminary back in Stone Age days, uh, which was been really theologate in the early to mid 80s, uh, I was fed a steady diet of Karl Rahner uh, mm -hmm. in my systematic theology courses. In fact, I only learned about Balthazar and others of his thinking on my own. You know, uh, Me too. Me not, too. Be not because of seminary, really, uh, other than actually an undergraduate seminary. I had a professor that introduced me to Balthazar. But anyway, one of the things that came out loud and clear uh, from Rahner was that atonement theology is dead, uh, at least the, as Rahner was presented to us at that time. Guys, and that's why it struck me when you began your conversation today talking about this all began teaching seminarians. Yes. And yes. Uh, I'm thinking, this is what I was taught as a seminarian. This whole way of thinking is dead and gone. This idea of God as a vindictive, uh, you know, sadist in the sky who isn't going to forgive our sins until he gets his pound of flesh, you know, poured out on this cross from this son who pays the price through inflicting punishment, you know, uh, from the father. And then, you know, so God goes from being angry to being happy because an innocent man got butchered on a cross this is barbaric, this is monstrous, and this is substitutionary atonement theory and satisfaction theory, and none of this can, uh, you know, go on today. And so I just, I thought, I remember thinking, number one, yeah, uh, that's true if that is the doctrine of atonement, and it's not. <laughs> so I thought, yes. that's it. then I remember, then I went and started reading Balthazar, and Balthazar was kind of defending Anselm, and, and, mm -hmm. and say, no, wait a minute, Carl, you know, there, there's something here in Anselm that you're missing. And then I read Balthazar's Soteriology, where he holds up those five models that aren't reducible to each other, but they all have to sort of maintain a, a tension with each other, which is mm -hmm. rooted in his deep biblical exegesis. All of these are reasons why I greatly love this text, because it, it reinvigorated, revivified in my mind, uh, the the reasons, the very bogus reasons why atonement theology fell on such hard times. Right, right. Because it was tied to such a, a caricature of, yes. of, of what it is that we actually believe as Christians ab about the atonement. But then secondarily, it, it nuances that same thing uh, about how these different models hang in tension. Yes. Uh, but I would like, uh, oh, that's just sort of statement, not so much question. Um, one of the things that, that, strikes me, therefore, in, in a properly balanced uh, uh, theology of atonement, you guys have both alluded to it, is how it needs to be theocentric. It's it's a God-centered yes. action. Yes. And obviously what your text also brings out is that it's a Trinitarian action. Yes. Uh, and, and therefore, the theodrama of Balthazar and others brings out the absolute, this is critical to every, from my theology for 30 years now, the, the critical importance of freedom. Mm -hmm. and the role of freedom. So at one point in your book, I don't remember where, you make this statement, and this really struck me, and I think it goes to the core of this Trinitarian dimension, that Christ on the cross, his action on the cross, does not displace our humanity and freedom, but emplaces it. Yes. Emplaces. I wonder if you could, both of you could comment on the emplacing of our humanity in Christ, not the displacing. All right. I'll... I'll give it a shot, and Adrian, then you pick up the debris and fix it. <laughs> you guys have really, you guys are giving the audience a really false uh, impression of, of, of me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, this, well, again, uh, uh, I began by saying, remember that uh, atonement is the, the, the filial, say, modality of a a, in an interpersonal process. Um, in my book, according to uh, biblical revelation, we see that this whole process is a, a, a two-sided process, a process of, of forgiveness and atonement, of paternal love and filial love, uh, mutually and inseparably 
uh, asserting the, their uh, love against sin. Um, weak creatures are created in the place of the son vis-a-vis -vis the father. And we're created in the son in order to be divinized also, deified in the son, in order to receive the father's love, the, the gift of his paternal love, and allow it to engender in us a, a mirroring response um, as sons in the son. So our calling uh, is is to live here and everlastingly as sons in the son before the father, as receptive and correspondingly active in, 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 in being drawn into this mystery of mutual love between father and son in the Trinity. So basically, when uh, the son comes and takes our place before the father, what he means to do is to reestablish us, in fact, as sons in the son, uh, to enable us to be uh, participate in his, once again, reestablished as sons before the father. And as sons, we are thereafter to enact our sonship. And enacting our sonship, living a life of filial love in this sin-marred world, in this fallen world, inevitably entails atonement. Atonement is the work of filial love asserting itself against sin uh, and thereby eliminating it. There's, there's so much more to it, but that's one very broad stroked sketch of this. In other words, God aims to father us in Christ, to be in our own, per to, we might put it this way, to prolong his generation of the son, or even to prolong the historical mission of the son, a mission aimed at giving glory to God and atoning for sin, that mission of sonship, that work of sonship is to be prolonged in our historical and personal lives, existences. Does that make sense? It makes glorious sense. And it helps us also to define sin properly as that which distorts our capacity for such filial relationship and robs us of our capacity for such filial relationship uh, rather than something necessarily that is bringing down wrath upon us you know because it violates some taboo adrian did, did you uh, i'm going to bring adrian into the yeah. conversation uh, was there any debris that needed to be cleaned yeah, up yeah, yeah. Uh, i don't think so no no of course not no no of course not um well, I was just thinking about two two things. Um, one, uh, you know, I was reading um, Aquinas on the Passion yesterday, yes. and uh, he says um, God could have dealt with sin by power alone, but uh, he wanted to deal with it also by justice. And uh, the justice there is uh, has to do not only with uh, sort of restoring, you know, to God what what we withdrew from Him, um, but what what's what's at stake also is the fact that man is involved in making up for. In, in in that restoration right right so um and uh i mean that the the uh you know this is the classical thought right i mean we can't as sinners we we're supposed to do that um we're supposed to restore to god what we withdrew from him um but we can't right and uh of course, the, the, the one who 
sort of performs that restoration has to has to be God, but but he also has to be man. Yes. Right. So that's one thought. And then the second thought, which is related to that, is is the one that uh, Athanasius develops in On the Incarnation. And he's just stealing from St. Paul in 2 Corinthians, who says that uh, if one died, all died. Mm-hmm. So... Um, um, it's it's not just that finally there's a human being who can sort of do what the rest of us can't do. Um, I mean, again, because he's the son of God, but also because he's sort of, you know, free of, of sin along with his, his mother. Um, but it's it's also that uh, he represents us and he represents us in a way that it, it isn't just that he makes up for what the rest of us fail to do. Although that's, that's also part of it, uh, actually. Um, but, but it's, it's also that there's a certain sense that, uh, in him dying, we die um, it's as if he he were um, containing all of us in himself uh, in this act of of uh, restoring in in his humanity to God the Father what what we what we withdrew right so um, but but I think then that that there's a kind of natural progression from that or or, or bridge from that thought to the one that. Margaret was saying that uh, um, this is all about re-emplacing us in the relationship between the Father and the Son because it's not the case either that because he's represented us in this way then everything is done and we don't have to do anything. Um, <laughs> actually, we, we have to, um, we then have to accept the fact that this has happened, um, and uh, but it's as if accepting the fact that this has happened is possible because it did happen. Yes. So the fact yes. of being yeah. the fact of being taken down into the grave with him on the cross, sort of objectively, then makes it possible for us you know, through the grace of the Holy Spirit to say yes to that um, and um, sort of subjectively then to go down into the grave with him, as it were, in a way w- where um, the fact that we've been included then uh, is acknowledged, appropriated, and, and starts to take over our lives. Yes. You know, in listening to you, Adrian, if I may a- add this, I, I'm. Oh, please! Really... So you're picking up my degree now. This no, 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 no. This is this is just fun. This okay. is a true conversation where we inspire exactly. each other. And That's you it. guys want debris? I can give you debris. And, uh, here we so, go. So I'm, I'm the king <laughs> of some, debris. I'll have now, some debris. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please, yeah. I did not. I didn't. In, I did not include this in my in my book. But I I'm sure there is a place in one of Hoffman's articles where he suggests that we regard the um, mission of uh, Christ unto atonement as a kind of uh, sort of um, second creation or recreation that just like as in, in the, let's say, original yeah. cre- creation, we, we were created um, in the place of the sun out of nothing, out of the void, but it was a positive voice, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Whereas here uh, we are with the, when God sends his, his son into our sin condition place, he means to restore that to be a, uh, the, the locus yeah. of sonship. And in such a way that now God is reestablishing us, uh, begetting us as sons in the son out of the evil void. 
Yes. That's the, it's the new creation. But in what right. makes it new is is now God is recreating us, beget, regenerating us as yeah. sons in the sun out of an evil void. Does right. that make I, sense? Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and 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 not not because evil actually is good or 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 evil was necessary or evil was mm -hmm. sort of a willed part of the plan, but because God is that powerful and that good that he can he can sort of um trick evil mm -hmm. <laughs> uh into playing into his own hands as he turns the tables on it. You know? I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that old patristic mm -hmm. uh, thing about you know that the atonement the happens. Death. Yeah, because yeah. Christ is the is the bait on the fish hook and the devil takes it and uh you know, yeah, that's, yeah. that's yeah. his demise. I love that image. Yeah, and there's something. There's really something to that. I mean, I what I was when you were talking, Margaret. The other thing that was coming into my mind. I mean, another theme. I mean, this is just so infinitely rich, right? I know, and, I know. And and, and again, that's one of the great things about your book is that it's it's very rigorous and clear, but but it's not. Um, there's no uh, pseudo tidiness, you know. No, no. Um, it's. So, but, but the, the theme of the glorious exchange, right? That, yes. that he sort of, yes. it's as if, I mean, I was using this kind of clunky language of objective and subjective. I mean, maybe, maybe it is clunky, but, but maybe another way to think about it. And it was somehow prompted by what you just said that, um, it, it's sort of like if, if you wanted to use an image, a kind of a kind of very physical image, it would be like when he goes to the cross and and dies and and descends into the grave. Um, he kind of takes us as sinners with him um, and makes it possible for us to to die to sin. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But then that's complemented necessarily by a movement where uh, we take him as the one who was filial, filially obedient unto death. And how do we know that? Because he did what I just said. We take him into ourselves and are sort of... Um, regenerated right i mean there there's there's a kind of supernatural aspect that goes with that that taking in um there there is a, a an adoption there's an adoptive sonship which has to do with sanctifying grace there's there's deification but but there's also to your point there's also a restoration of our humanity because mm -hmm. um I mean, as you know, Margaret, better than 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 any of us, um, there's something sun-like or filial about our humanity, even as a creature, right? And that that's why I, I think Saint Luke is pointing us in that direction in in his genealogy of Christ, which goes back to yes. Adam, who was a son of God. God, yes. And 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 Luke doesn't mean. Christ and Adam are on the same level, no. right? I mean, he, Luke knows that Christ is is God the Son in a in in a unique sense. Um, the point is rather that even on the even on the sort of creaturely and natural level, there's something sunlike about our nature, yes. right? Be because yes. Yes. because we're created for the grace of sonship of sonly friendship with God. There, there's something in our nature that corresponds to that, that, yes. that gives it a yes. kind of a natural foundation yes. and so on and so forth. And that too is restored. There, there's a kind yes. of, in that sense, there's yes. a recreation. And then as you say, the miracle is that um, the, the material or the, the, the out of which God created in this case was, was, our attempt to undo all of that through sin. So it's like just at the moment when we attempt mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. undo this whole plan and it looks like we succeeded because we put the son of God to death, he turns the tables on us and 
makes and does what everything that I said and that you, you know yes. you're saying in your book, yes. right? Yes. Just one thought came to mind as I was listening to you, yeah. and uh, it, it comes from the catechism. And I'm going to use this opportunity to say that my book also, I hope, uh, effectively demonstrates that these four theological guides, um, their most important convictions and profound insights find a place and an endorsement in the catechism. Interesting, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. You'll, you'll see, so uh, uh, time and again, I fold in references mm -hmm. to, to yeah. the catechism. Yeah. And the particular um, statement from the catechism that came to mind as I was listening to you, Adrian, was the line that says, talking about the filial character of our nature, so to speak, yeah. under understood um, in view of the mystery of the Trinity that are, yeah. are were created and called yeah. in the place of the Son. The, the not only our if our nature, then so also our activity, our yeah. action, and and also our prayer and our suffering. Yeah. Filial in character, filial in orientation. And the line is this, Christ enables us, now, having accomplished his mission for us and with the Father outpoured his spirit, the spirit of sonship, yeah. into our hearts. Christ enables us to live in him all that he himself lives. Right. And he lives it in us. There's that wondrous exchange, yeah. but it need be understood. We're over here in the, the in the place of sonship. This is a filial mode of existence and action. That, that, that's right. It, it's it's not just an, a generic Godhead over against even a humanity defined. A generic reference. humanity. Yes. That's it. Yes. That, that that's it. That's core for. I mean, that's something that I I has become much clearer to me sort of over the last few months that um so christ is indeed perfect god and perfect man he has an integral human nature in fact we, we talked about this uh larry and rodney and i on the the episode of this that i did a couple of weeks ago um but the the integrality the integrity rather of of the humanity the completeness of the humanity of jesus um itself as a natural thing as a human thing is 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 already filial and and it's filial in a kind of a double sense one because nature and it's con human nature and its constitutive logos has to do with the filial mm -hmm. and it it's scripture says this mm -hmm both in the old and new testament but but so in a way does every 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 culture does you know it's like the the kings in these in these great civilizations are are actually not gods they're sons of god they're sons of heaven yes, so, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. so but also because um the the lord in his humanity is the inheritor of the whole history of Israel, which is also already about restoring yes. and, and sort of bringing to perfection also that natural sonship, right? Um, you know, the, the again, right, the, the, uh, the, the Psalms, there's so many Psalms that the, the scripture scholars say are, were sort of coronation Psalms, or, or, right? But that have been referred to the Messiah, to the Lord, um psalms that like psalm 110 that says you know um uh or or the or the the the, the psalm that says uh, the second psalm right you know you are my son this day i've begotten mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but there's not a contradiction there between saying this is a th this psalm is a kind of uh it was written f to celebrate a coronation or something like that probably just making this up, but the scripture scholars say that sort of thing. And on the other hand, saying that it's a prefiguration of the Messiah because the Messiah of Israel is going to be the inheritor of that, that, yes. that, that filial royalty. For, for yes. example, that's just one yes. of many examples, you yes. know, um, there's something filial about the suffering servant, right? And yes. the Lord is the yes. suffering yes. servant and on and on and on. Yes. So anyway, yes. 
I think this is very important, especially in in the current climate and our day and age. A lot yes. of the issues swirl around. We yes. have a tendency, obviously, and too many people in the church think this way, to simply drink in the toxins of our culture and to imbibe uh, to imbibe this mentality that all of this language in the scriptures about our filial relationship with God, all this creational language about family and sonship and, and fatherhood and all that, these are mere poetic glosses right. on what is essentially a pretty mundane, naturalistic, evolutionary sort of thing that is rather fungible and plastic and we can do with it whatever we want. And now we also therefore have to retroactively and go back and play with the words of scripture because obviously it's patriarchal and, and it also male centered and so on. And yet what in reality, what we need is this robust, what the theology of the atonement shows us is as you mapped it out as how deeply linked it is with a robust retrieval of the theology of creation and, and, yeah. and that, the, the family, the family, as, as it is revealed in the scriptures, has metaphysical and theological standing and significance yep. that goes beyond mere biology and genetics and, and the fluidity of human relationships and has a deep and abiding significance. Yes. yes. M Margaret, you should, I, I, I was thinking, I mean, not to usurp your role, Larry, as, as question asker, but... No, this is, hey, I got to say, this is the first time I've done an interview when I've been able to sit back and actually enjoy the conversation and not have to be sitting and thinking of my next question. So you go right ahead, Adrian. I'm okay, so you're going to go get a cup of coffee and we'll just talk. Well, I have my iced tea. Yeah, you've got your, you lucky bum. Yeah, I should have made some coffee. But, but Margaret, I mean, maybe I, I was thinking, you know, one, one thing you should talk about precisely in this context is sort of your your understanding of God's fatherhood yes and and all that and then the other thing I I hope I mean I'm just springing ahead and maybe you were going to ask this Larry but your whole account of what's what, what is meant by wrath and filial love suffering and all of that because that that's so at the core of it but it, it occurs to me that, that, that this so thing much. about fatherhood uh your your sense of fatherhood I mean in a my, my you you have a sort of you you see the atonement as as a filial act but but it's really a kind of a patrocentric in the end and maybe you could I, tie I do, that in. Yeah. yes i i do claim that that um atonement is in the first place a work of god in his paternity yeah. but what but what uh, god fathers is is in fact a beloved enabled to play his corresponding yeah. role his properly filial role yeah. that that in fact is the shall we say atoning role but because again yeah. it's filial it's it's always indicates a a relationship it's a yes. sonship, fil affiliation it's, it's a correlative term so I, I, whenever i say son i always have in mind absolutely the, the father who's yeah. always with him who not only sent him and remained at a remote distance from the son but accompanies the son is ever at work in the son and it, it, certainly um marvelously uh, in the son's uh, consummate work of bearing the sin of the world fully and finally yeah. so yeah i think one of the contributions of this book is is that uh, I I am relentless in 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 expanding the the theological frame of of reference to include uh, father not only son the father and the Holy Spirit chapters one two and three um, and so yeah I believe as as uh, uh, Larry you initially were talking about. Uh, you know, some of the reasons behind the modern aversion to the doctrine of atonement, uh, the reasons for the contemporary repugnance to all of this. Yeah, yeah. And many of, of uh, those reasons have to do with a, a distorted depiction of God the Father's role mm. in all of this. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so that has to be fixed. At the same time, uh, it, it, it should be needless to say that the son in everything he he says and does means to glorify the father. To see me is to see the father. And, and certainly in the 
consummate work that I do. The father remains at work in me, enabling me uh, to bear the sin of the world unto his, the father's glory. And as, as his, the father's definitive exegete, definitive interpreter, definitive um, uh, revealer. And here I'm just thinking of John 1.18. No one has ever seen God, the father. It's the only son closest to the father's heart or, you know, turn toward the father, moving toward the father who as man unto death on her cross, living out his sonship, his relation to the father in terms of this human existence in this sin marred world reveals the father. Yeah. And, and so I just, I had become during my, my years of um, theological study, I, I become frustrated and borderline annoyed by the Latin, no, truly. The, 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 <laughs> yeah. No, Larry I mean, and I everyone, are laughing because we've, no. we've gone so far over that border that the- No, but it was just, <laughs> even when I'm listening, you know, to Orthodox lectures and so on, uh, everyone was speaking and, and under, rightfully about the Son and the Holy Spirit and a, and hardly a word was said about God right. the Father. And whenever the, even the notion of divine paternity was mentioned, brought into play, it was somehow very quickly uh, coinciding with the divine nature as such. God as, you know, creator over against, not the Trinitarian Father who's rich in mercy, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I became quite intent upon making sure that our theological vision of God included all three of the divine persons. And in the first place, God the Father. And this concern was also, um, it was bolstered by my, my discovery of the church fathers. It's when I began to go back and read Origen, Athanasius, Gregory of Nyssa, Maximus the Confessor, I was delighted to discover how, how careful they are to keep their theological gaze fixed on the Father, not ignoring the Son, but always when they look to the Son, they always already see him as the image of the Father. And they understand his activity as properly filial, mm -hmm. reflective of paternal divine activity. So my four guides, what they're doing, I learned a bit later, is they're going back and their recovery of the biblical sources and the patristic sources. They become contemporary sources for me to widen this scope of theological understanding to include God's paternity and therefore to understand atonement as in the first place, the work of God in his paternity. All that God does as father is to generate uh, a, a living image of his own manner of loving, a complementary filial image of his way of being and acting divinely. Once you get that pattern, it, it becomes sort of a, like, a, like a fugue, you know, once you understand, like a musical pattern, a few, yeah. you can understand when you go back and read the Old Testament, you go, you read uh, the lives of the Christian saints, mm. you can more readily discern this, this pattern, a paternal, filial pattern of, of love, reciprocal love played out in the context of a sin marred world. You see the prophets playing the filial role over against the father. You see Therese of Lisieux being drawn into the filial role over against God the father. And in both sides, uh, with Christ being the keystone, the, the Old Testament prophets and martyrs and the New Testament saints and martyrs are in their own different ways being drawn into this this dynamic, this interpersonal dynamic drawn into the place of the sun in this dynamic, which means they're opening in with and through the sun. They are opening their hearts to the love of the father and letting God's uh, fatherly love take full effect in them, enabling them by way of filial love, 
God engendered love, filial love, then to enact their sonship in opposition to sin and bearing, bearing sin away by, by transforming sin into its opposite. Now there's a whole there are there are many levels of the, of this mystery that are dealt with in the book that we're skimming over in in this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I I do I want to say this to your your viewers that one of the to my mind again one of the real benefits again from this book is in chapter one, the theology of, of atonement in the Old Testament, where uh, uh, there are other scripture scholars upon whom Balthasar himself depends, but not only him. Then there's John Levinson. I turn to that. Uh, John Levinson is the, he's the professor of Hebrew or Jewish studies at Harvard, a contemporary uh, scripture scholar and several other contemporary scripture scholars, including um, the, the two from Notre Dame. Um, no, the guy, he wrote Charity and, and Sin. Gary Anderson. Yes, Gary, Gary, Gary Anderson. Anderson. Gary Anderson. Yes. But, but also Anatolios, who's, who's not in the first place a scripture scholar. He's, he's best known for his patristic uh, scholarship. But nonetheless, what I found in Anatolios' works, both his his uh, book on um, Nicaea, Recovering Nicaea, and uh, his book on uh, the cross and deification. Deification right. to the cross. And for yes. my viewers, this is Father Khalid Anatolios. And yes. Very, very interesting thinker. Oh, what he does is he too shows, in full agreement with my four guides, he shows that already in the Old Testament, the, the job description of the prophet included entering into the subjectivity of, of God, of being, being, letting himself experience and represent particularly God's pain and anger in the face of sin. That the prophet's role, and it's a filial role, was to turn toward God and, and see, come to an understanding of, of God's passionate involvement with his beloved. And that this divine involvement, a passionate involvement in the face of sin takes this twofold or has twofold aspects, both a love suffering and a, and a wrath. And interesting how the prophet then lets, turns toward the God and father of Israel, opens himself to the spirit of God, who inwardly shapes the prophet in such a way that he becomes one who experiences and represents before the people, the heart of God, the true character of God, and the true way in which God exercises power in the face of sin. Does, it make, does that make sense? But oh, I, I, it's, it makes perfect sense. What I love about that is, number one, the revelatory character of, or the revelatory role and function of the prophet and eventually Jesus Christ, and then of Christians in Christ, is given due attention. Is given due attention. I had I had earlier said, um, you know, brought to mind the 18th verse of the Joanine prologue where no one has ever seen God. It's the only son closest to the father's heart or in the bosom of the father who has made him known. But one has to remember uh, that there's also the first epistle of John, where in chapter four, we find uh, this repeated. No one has ever seen God. And we're thinking, oh, I know what's coming next. It's, it's going to be a reference to the only son, the only begotten God who has made him know. And John, nope. In that epistle, John says, but if we love one, if we open our hearts, let God's love uh, come to perfection in us. And notice who's love. It's God's generative love that aims to penetrate us and inwardly shape us into his living image, 
And at the same time, then living out our sonship, we're atoning for sin. So again, one of, of I think the, the um, real virtues of the book is that while it's, it is a book on atonement, it never separates the, this, uh, the function of atonement from what it's always coupled with in the Bible. The function of glorifying the Father, of revealing the Father. Right. To atone isn't in filial fashion to interpret the Father. Even, if, But it's not simply to, to God's glory. It's at the same time a work that's eliminating sin. Because who God is is totally for us. And his love aims to eliminate sin such that we are again reborn, reshaped as his living images the, the living icons of his love in this world. Does that make sense? Oh, it sure does. Um, and I, I have, oh gosh, so many things floating around in my head, uh, how much sense th that makes. Um, and pardon me if this takes us off on a tangent away from those beautiful points you were just making, but I, I've just been, have floating in my head lately how, much it is all the rage these days to talk about atonement as theosis, uh, which is not something I'm opposed to at all. Uh, I believe in the concept of theosis, divinization. Um, but it does strike me that a great deal of what passes for theosis theology these days uh, veers, in my opinion, too far in the direction of an overly therapeutic model right uh, of 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 what salvation consists yeah. of you know that well we, we're creatures on uh, on this pathway to god and we all have these little character flaws and these little imperfections uh and we just need to go on god's psychiatrist couch and have those things fixed and and uh, in other words it's it's all altogether too smooth too therapeutic yeah. in that sense now i'm not disputing yeah. the notion yeah. that salvation mm -hmm. is purgative and therefore therapeutic and healing. I'm not yes. disputing that. I'm trying to make distinctions here between differing concepts of, of what constitutes God's thera therapeutic towards us. Uh, and, and it seems to me that what both Adrian in his earlier comments about Aquinas and, and you now in your comments about the vicariousness of us entering into God's very, very pattern of love is that there has to be, there has to remain, and this is one of Balthazar's point, some elements still of of a divine wrath towards sin. That of that's a, key. Yeah. So Adrian, can you and both of you can come? Well, on. I mean, I, I want I want Margaret to talk about this, but maybe just a, a quick thought. Um, so I think one of the things that Margaret's book helps us understand is that God's wrath is the wrath of a pained lover let's say right, right right and and so another way of putting of putting that thought or at least a way of expressing a similar thought or related thought is that uh god's wrath has to do with uh his zeal for our good and uh our good as as margaret is has has been telling us is um, to be filial, right? To sort of have our natural filiality perfected in our being sons in the sun. Um, notice that that, uh, that good has a dialogical character, right? That, that in other words, um, God the Father wants us to be sons in the sun, so he, he, he wants us to be turned back towards himself but but as distinct from him as other right in this filial yeah. dialogue now yeah. um it seems to me that then uh, th this sort of suggests to me another point that margaret is making and has already made here which is that um the expression of so that wrath as a kind of expression of zeal for are good, right? It's it's that God loves us too much to leave us alone and and to take our our self destruction lying down, you know. Um, uh, involves um, 
uh, sort of the other who um, is 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 provoking the wrath. I mean, uh, the the other who's provoking the wrath has has to kind of feel the weight of it. Yes. Right. Has to, but 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 not but precisely not as you know, the sadistic God or the, 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 the God who, who is sort of takes it personally because he's really small minded, but, but <laughs> already in feeling the weight of it, the, the, the person, the penitent, so to speak, has to, has to start to understand that the, the weight that he's feeling is precisely the, the weight of a zeal for, for his own, yes. his own good. So, but but as as soon as the person does that, as soon as the penitent does that, right? As soon as he begins to accept to feel the weight of it as a kind of appropriate expression of zeal for for his own good, and for the and for the good of the relationship that that he's broken, he already begins to participate in and reflect back in a new way, the the zeal of the of God. Um, for his good and for the relationship, and so the communion begins to be restored right there. And I, and I think that that um, that and 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 the kind of the again the sort of marvel of this is that um, you know the same God who is sort of expressing his his zealous wrath and and you know wants us precisely out of love and as a kind of act of generosity. Yes. To let us feel it along with him, so to speak, um, uh, so that communion can be reestablished, is also the same God who is on the other side as Son, um, living out that mystery to the full in his humanity for our sake so that we can be drawn into it, right? I mean, that's something that I think I understood from. I mean, it, it, it really all snapped into focus for me, even before your book, Margaret. I remember a couple of years ago, we did a conference on Balthazar. You, you organized it in November of 2019, and you gave a presentation of this doctrine of atonement. Um, and it just, yeah, it, it, all of that kind of became clear to me. And I, you know, I hope that I was able to give it back in a way that was somewhat clear. Because it's it there's a lot a lot of moving pieces, but I, I don't know so what, what what there are so many moving pieces. Yeah, and so I I, I don't want to pretend that that we can um, you know very quickly just just do you know put them all together and do the math. It. Yeah, no, but I I'm going to I'm going to begin at least by highlighting certain elements. Uh, yeah. That concern that really it's the de it's a development of the notion of of divine wrath. Yes, and, and it, it seems to me that notion is still under development, as is the notion of God's love suffering. Yeah, still un uh, under development. Sure. But when I, I think it important to begin in the Old Testament. Yeah, uh, where uh, uh, there, as one reads the Old Testament, it becomes gradually clear that God's wrath is more and more closely associated with God's injured love. That's why I'm saying, you know, this, the, these two aspects of uh, paternal love or two modalities of paternal love, uh, the love suffering and, and wrath are two aspects of this one in the same mystery of God's passionate involvement with right. his beloved. So here's another instance where, uh, again, the interpretive uh, frame has to has to be broad, ha has to uh, encompass yeah. multiplicity and often paradoxical um, uh, multiple elements. So in the Old Testament, we find is when God faces the his the effects of sin. He he hides his face. I mean, more often than not, whenever the Old Testament yeah. speaks of God turning his face away or hiding his face, it's signaling God's wrath, God in a disposition of divine wrath. And I just wanted to highlight here 
um, that this this understanding of God's wrath taking the form of hiding his face is especially significant to the whole theme of God's glory uh, in throughout biblical history. Yeah. If, if in fact God, God has created us, well, at, finally, let's just start with Israel, called Israel, established Israel to be his living image in this world, such that the nations, no one has ever seen God, but if the nations turn toward Israel and see Israel, God's Yahweh's firstborn son, living with um, attitudes um, and according to conduct that are true, authentic images of uh, the character of the God of Israel, then God, okay, if Israel fulfills its vocation, God will glorify Israel. Yeah. But insofar as Israel turns its back on God and so exhibits attitudes and conduct that uh, uh, falsify it, 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 its function as the image of God in this world, insofar as Israel acts as a counterfeit son and a false image, God has to dec discredit that his image. He's only known, God as father is only known in his filial beloved. And, and so he calls a beloved to be the one who will allow him to father, to shape them uh, such that he, God, can be known in his beloved, known as the lover in his beloved, known, um, yes, as father in his son. If that son goes bad and that image becomes counterfeit, God has to withdraw, so to speak. He's got to, in some way, manifestly discredit yeah. it, the, the image. Yeah. Can the, I, I, I yeah. go ahead. I'd like to add something to that. I, I agree with that completely. But I would also add I, that I think it's also a, an indication, once again, of how much God respects our freedom. Well, that's it. Yeah. Because in turning away, in hiding from us, it's everything that you say, but it's also a recognition that is not sin itself in its deepest manifestation an attempt to hide from God. Yes. An, an attempt to flee from, is not Satan he who hides in the sense that all liars are hiding things. Uh, anyway, yes. I, I just throw that out there that, that I think that's part of it too. Uh, a simple respecting of our choice that we choose yes. to hide from God yes. every single yes. time we sin. Uh, and that what is at stake here often are, com are, are competing notions of imminence and what imminence is. Uh, anyway, yeah. I, that, that would take well, to very far afield. The, actually, is, go ahead. Well, now I'm interrupting. I mean, uh, but I wanted to say something about imminence and also about freedom. But no, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I just want to point out that that there is. Uh, uh, it, 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 obviously, I think the battle lines uh, in modernity vis-a-vis -vis the church and Christian revelation in general, the battle lines are drawn over what constitutes the integrity of the worldly world, what constitutes a true imminence, what constitutes freedom within that imminence. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. You know, and that the part and parcel of the doctrine of atonement and, of course, incarnation and creation yeah. is a proper understanding of imminence. As an unveiling, as an, un an unveiling of something eschatological and bigger than simply the worldly world. Um, and that uh, the, 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 the demonic is essentially characterized as a desire for nothing but imminence, uh, a pure hyper imminence, as I call right. it, uh, devoid of orientation to transcendence and thus seeks of an unveiling that is actually a real veiling, a, a, a hiding, a hiding from God. And yeah. As we see in the Garden of Eden, where they, they immediately tried to hide, okay, uh, they, they've got something to hide. Anyway, these are all deeply yes, speculative yes, yes, yes. BS ideas floating around in my head uh, because I was just writing about this. Yes. Uh, but anyway, Adrian, go ahead. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, yeah, that so the... Uh, 
I mean, I thought you were, but may, maybe this is pertinent. But I mean, <clears throat> you know, I was actually talking about um, something to do with all of this last night with uh, uh, a new friend who, who's a very fine biblical scholar. And uh, we were sort of talking about how um, there's something often sort of deliberately off-putting, deliberately off-putting about the scriptures. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, you know, obviously that off, that, it's deliberate. There's a pedagogical reason. Um, one of the things that's off-putting is is anthropomorphism, which is just there from beginning to end. And of course, one of the ways of dealing with that off-putting anthropomorphism is by saying, "Well, th th these are the texts of primitive minds. Um, primitive, not only in the sense that they weren't capable of real metaphysics, but primitive in the sense that they were sort of." themselves resentful and vindictive people who projected their resentfulness and vindictiveness onto, you know, their tribal deity, right? Uh, right, right, so, right. Uh, shades of Nietzsche, maybe. Yahweh but, is a tribal war god. Yeah, but but the fact of the matter is that, um, and th that uh, the anthropomorphism has something to do with the covenant and the reciprocity of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the sort of, it may seem paradoxical, but it's actually, it's actually true that that, recip that covenantal reciprocity where it's sort of like the God of heaven and earth, <laughs> you know, appears on this, this, the narrow earthly stage and, and, uh, you know, discredits, you know, elects, but then also discredits and, you know, wrestles with his people and all of that in a very anthropomorphic way, that, that, uh, that all of that covenantal reciprocity is actually the ultimate expression of God's, that kind of eminence is the ultimate expression of God's transcendent uh, yes. freedom of, from need and generosity. Why? Because um, uh, as, as Kierkegaard says, you know, only, only omnipotence can actually make free, can only create free, only omnipotence can create freedom, Me meaning, um, which, which I think implies, among other things, that it's precisely uh, the ability to create freedom and engage with it that uh, is the mark of an omnipotence and a transcendence that doesn't need that created freedom or the engagement with it in order to be itself. Right? The, the, yeah, the, yeah. Right? It's, it's, um, so the, so for example, I mean, to take another example, right? I mean, you know, God doesn't need to be prayed to by us to decide what to do. Um, but the fact that he incorporates our petitions into his providential plan is, is an act of generosity, which shows that he's so in charge and so, you know, precisely not threatened by otherness that um, he can sort of engage with it without losing his, precisely his sort of sovereign and serene transcendence. And so I, I, I think you, you know, I think that, so you, 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 ha you have to both take really seriously, right, the kind of density of, of this anthropomorphic language and not immediately try to explain it away because right. after all, we're too right. spiritual for this. Right. But then, but then you have to see that this, this anthropomorphic density at the same time actually is the expression of this supreme, unenvious, Yes. you know, truly impassable transcendence. And then lo and behold, when you, when you, when you put those two things together and you see them, you kind of superimpose them. What does that look like? That looks like the incarnation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, it, it looks, it, it looks like the, 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 the one who, while remaining, you know, the God that he is also becomes man. And, um, uh, 
and and embodies for us in both directions, you know, so to speak. You know, God's yeah. kind of you know uh, dealings with us and our and our dealings back it embodies for us what um, um, what this creative transcendent generosity of God that founds covenantal reciprocity looks like when it's taken to its it's, it's truly ultimate conclusion, right? Yes, I'm reminded of uh, Balthazar's volumes on metaphysics in in the aesthetics, uh, which I did my dissertation on, essentially. Uh, and and Balthazar, I remember in the realm of metaphysics in antiquity, Balthazar makes, he sort of begins by, by with Homer. <laughs> yeah. And he says, the, Hom Hom the Homeric world of the gods is not simply incredible, you know, right. unbelievable today. And what he points to is the essentially dialogical quality of the realm of the divinity and its relations with humanity. So you can dismiss it all as these gross anthropomorphisms, but I, I like your phraseology there, that there was a density in those anthropomorphisms and those personified gods. But then, of course, the gods are still finite and capricious right. and arbitrary. So that then spurns its opposite in the sort of monistic Greek philosophy, and, right. you know, oneness and all that, that heaps scorn on the poets and so on. And that vacillation goes back and forth, and it's, that knot is only untied by a Trinitarian understanding of God and the incarnation of God in Christ. What, what Margaret is talking about here, all of this stuff, yes. filial and paternal. Um, and can, can I just throw in one other thing, and then, and then yeah, wait, Margaret, you need to pick up the thread again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Maximus the Confessor of all people, right? And, and Maximus is, is, you know bears eloquent witness to the fact that God in his nature is not one thing among many who's in, enmeshed in any sort of uh, natural pairing with the world or anything in the world. There's no, there's no passability there. There's no natural uh, sort of passion that God is subject to in any way. Maximus, the confessor of all people, says uh, in the 10th chapter of the Ambigua that God and man are models for each other. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's interesting. I've yeah. never heard that before. Yeah, God and man are paradigms for each other, he says. You know, And it has to do with just the, the point, again, that you were making, Larry, and the point Margaret is making is that he, he puts it in terms that, that it's sort of like um, uh, they're models for each other, not, not because... God in his nature is sort of naturally paired with man as if man were a second God alongside God, but because God is so generous, um, yeah. so without need, that he can enter into a kind of reciprocity without, without undergoing change, you know, and, and the reciprocity for Maximus looks exactly like this, that man, so God models is a paradigm for man because man is to be deified, and and uh, man is a kind of model for God because God wants to manifest Himself in human form, and and the bond of the mutual exchange is charity. You know, is love. And he, he, Maximus says. Yeah. Anyway, I. I that's kind of, that's we're, great. We're kind of we we kind no. of we, we no, didn't get away from your no. point, but I mean we're no. kind of. No, we're, 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 so showing, we're showing how fruitful her thought is because now we're riffing. It's mystery. We're riffing, all right, on, on exactly. the ideas. Go ahead. Exactly. Go ahead, Margaret. Well, I, what? We're all running right. Of, we're running out of time. We have maybe five I, or ten minutes left. So oh, gosh. Uh, okay, that, that's fine. I mean, but again, I hope that, that this text does inspire people who are smarter than I am uh, to, to continue these lines of theological. Uh, reflection and speculation and, and and wrap up many, it's not so much a loose end as it is you get so far and you're still looking out on the horizon and realize the, the mystery always and will always ever, it exceeds our, our intellectual grasp. But um, I did want to, I wanted to circle back yeah. and, and make, make clear that when I spoke of uh, divine wrath, as taking yeah. the for form of God's hiding his face, and I'm simply borrowing biblical language. Yeah. That, that again, is, is not a one-sided 
move on God's part. That actually what you see, for example, when in the northern kingdom, when it, it uh, runs after its false gods, um, according to the prophet Hosea, God, in, first of all, is heartbroken. He manifests his, his divine passion of love, his paternal love, suffering over against um, unfaithful Israel. But in his response, God's response is, now mind you, they, they're the ones that took the initiative in separating themselves from God. So the sin wrought, this, the distance between God and Israel is sin wrought. And it, 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 it's wrought by the, the sinful behavior on Israel's part. But God, because of Israel's sinful behavior, in one sense, he has to hide his face. He, he has to discredit his, his beloved to the nations as this is a false and counterfeit son. You will not come to know me by, by knowing them, by knowing my chosen beloved. But God, even as he hides his face and allows Israel then to be uh, overcome by his enemies, Assyria, and be deported thereto, God nonetheless accompanies Israel into exile, albeit incognito. So God, at one and the same time, as God is hiding his face, and I'm sorry for the anthropomorphic <laughs> character of this, but as God is hiding his face, his heart remains with Israel. And he literally accompanies Israel. In fact, yeah. Hosea, Hosea says, speaking for Yahweh, I will lead her. I will lead her into the wilderness, hmm. into this, wow. into the, this, this, uh, God forsaken state. So God retains the initiative. He's not the sinner that, that the distance wrought there is due to sin, but God will never abdicate his initiative in all of this. And so he's claiming, I got this. I'm le I turn my face away in, in judgment against her sin. But at the same time, my love is steadfast. And I, my wrathful love itself always aims at, its, it, its zeal is directed toward an unswerving, this unswerving commitment to father, yeah. his, his living image, which is, is to um, the good and the glory of, of, of Israel. Um, this isn't a, a, an ego-centric, uh, you know, God who's just out for a self-glorification. But my point is, is is this that when God God is at once seemingly distant because he hides his face and yet yeah. near and the nearness the the unceasing nearness of God to his sinful beloved is essential because the only way Israel is going to be able to atone for sin is because God remains near offering his the forgiving love, offering this, this antecedent gift of grace, whereby his beloved can uh, come to a, a stance of repentance. Can What God will do is reenkindle filial love in the heart of his beloved, a, a love then that takes the form of, of contrition and remorse. And it's in, in, in by virtue of that re-enkindled God engendered filial love in his partner. So God is near that the, the partner will thereby bear, endure the effects of sin, distance from God, hiding his face, divine wrath unto sin's atonement. Wow. And does that make, make sense? Oh, yeah. and, and that's just, it's, it's so wonderful. It's fantastic. Yeah. But, yeah. but it's summed up in, in one line that tries to, does try in a pithy way to sum up this mystery of atonement as transforming sin into its opposite. Atonement would be the nearness to God because atonement is a filial work. It's, it's a God engendered work. God is near as a generative and archetypal source of, of, of the work of, of atonement. Nearness to God in the filial love suffering of distance from God. The filial love suffering of the effects of sin, yeah. the, the punishments, the consequences of sin. And I dare add that that line can be understood in Thomistic terms. Because when I teach this, 
this theology of atonement, 20th century, basically, theology of atonement, I do so subsequent to a very careful and faithful uh, reading of both Anselm and St. Thomas on their doctrines of redemption, satisfaction. Okay. Well, Thomas himself says, what, what makes, um, in, in what does uh, a work of satisfaction consist? There's a material element. You've got a, the consequences, the consequent punishments, the penalties, the effects of sin. It's a material element. But that alone isn't enough. You need the formal principle for atonement. And the formal principle is this filial love. Uh, it's charity. It's that heart inspired by charity that by virtue of this filial love, it, it, it bears, suffers the consequences of sin unto sin's atonement. And even Thomas says he doesn't, I, I think, doesn't sufficiently elaborate on the point. But in question 47, he'll give a nod to the God the Father and say, even in the work of Christ Jesus, yes, he is God the Son. But as man, it's God the Father who infuses charity in the heart of Christ. Question 47. It's God the Father who infuses charity yeah. in the heart of Christ, who inspires Christ as man to willingly be the vicarious bearer of sin. So in other words, when I said atonement is nearness to God in the filial love suffering of God's distance, that's Thomas, who inspires the filial love suffering, who inspires it? God, the father. So God is near. How is what is suffered? The effects of sin. Biblically understood, the effects of sin boil down to distance from God, separation from God. Wow. How is it suffered by filial love suffering? Filial, inspired by the father. So this isn't something entirely novel. It's 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 cast. If I, I would argue um, it's cast in terms that are more saturated with um, biblical theology um, and it is more consistently sketched against the horizon of the of the Trinity, the eternal Trinity. Right. I think that this uh, uh, this is a great way. I'm going to give both of you sort of a last word. But I think it's a great way to, to end because. What, what it shows is, I think, racial small theology at its best, which is not contra Aquinas, but an attempt to embed Aquinas in, and to take what is great in Aquinas, and he is great, and what's fantastic in there, and embed it in this wider, deeper, more enriching perspective that then allows Aquinas himself to live and breathe within the tradition in more vibrant ways than a stale old fashioned kind of scholasticism uh, would have for us. And I, that's one of the greatest things I found in your book was this breathtaking, you know, this breathtaking devotion to Aquinas, but within mm -hmm. this broader, mm -hmm. this broader mm -hmm. conversation of all these other voices. Uh, and it gives the lie to the idea that Ray Sosmont thinkers, you know, hate Aquinas or something. But I'm going to give you, uh, uh, we're, a little, we're a little over time. Adrian, I'm going to give you one last word, and then we'll come back to Margaret to give her the very last word. Uh, very fittingly so. Um, yeah. No, well, gosh, thanks. I, 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 I hope I didn't kind of talk too much during this thing no, because, you, you, you know, there, there, it's just, yeah, this I mean, is... but. We could yeah, do this again. Fun. There's oh nothing. Yeah, we, we could do should this do it again. again. I mean, uh, but but the um, uh, yeah, I just I think you're you're yeah. So in other words, to see that I mean, you you help us see that that every aspect of um, the passion as a as a redemptive act as an act of atonement. Um, including uh, the sort of experience, the sort of human experience of of the of the of the the sort of wrath of judgment, you know, yeah. uh, is all yes, all yes. from beginning to end about uh, the father engendering um, a response yeah. uh, that that sort of matches him, and therefore. Mm -hmm participates in all of the good that he has and is right yes so, so that right yes and, and then to kind of tie in 
a, a point that Larry made earlier. Uh, um, in doing that, um, not only is the, the father revealed sort of in a very practical way as the generous source, um, but also, you know, man is revealed, right? What, what human nature is, uh, what creation is for, and also, uh, I mean, b both because there's, a, there's, again, a sort of a supernatural destiny involved here, um, you know, becoming sons in the sun, but also because that that's the crowning and fulfillment of a, of a, of a natural filiality that that's inscribed in our being from the beginning. And that, that even in some sense uh, has to do with the nature of creation itself, you know, and, and, and I just do think uh, what one last thought, I mean, all of these themes to do with, wrath, distance, and all of that, if you, if you look at them in, in terms of this sort of fatherly generosity, it, it, they, they do, it also has great cultural significance for reasons yes. that Larry was yes. hinting at, right? That instead of everything being therapeutic and narcissistic, right, a space is open for us to kind of grow, actually, um, and, and, and to sort of participate um, in in the arduousness of it all, but in a, but it, but in a way that, that again, sets into relief a, a kind of a basic gift character that pervades the whole thing, because it's all about, again, the father generating us into a filiality that's not sort of dangling by, by these strings, you know, as if he were the puppet right, master, right. but is actually filial freedom, you know, anyway. Yes. That's fantastic. I, I love that. That's great. Especially since you referenced my comments. <laughs> okay, Margaret, you'll get the last word. And I hate to, I, I, the, 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 big, the biggest, this is already the longest uh, YouTube video I've ever done. And oh, so we're like, the, we're like the Voyager spacecraft now outside of the solar system. Exactly. Uh, gone further than I've ever gone. And so we will be taxing. The only reason why I like to cut these off at like an hour and 20 is because it takes yeah. so, so yeah. long to upload into YouTube. It, yeah. Is, anyways, but Margaret, go ahead. I, I want to... Uh... Fast forward to chapter three, which we, we, we did discuss for a bit, but, but not, not very much in relation to, or at least in comparison with chapters one and two on atonement in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I want to talk just a bit about um, this definition, if you will, of atonement. Atonement is nearness to God in the, in the filial love suffering of distance from God, uh, God's seeming absence, God's seeming silence. And I want to focus on this, this last element because God's seeming absence is, is apparent silence, certainly is the hallmark of our, our modern age, uh, where, you know, the, the eclipse of God uh, is, is, is typically understood as um, sort of unique to a hallmark of our contemporary age. So now what, what are we Christians called upon to do? We need night vision. We need to understand, we have to see in the dark and see God's glory at work under these, these conditions, conditions of, of, of sin, God's seeming absence, God's apparent silence. So we should not, given this, the increasing power, influence of secularism in our world, where God is all the more so um, seemingly absent, uh, silent. Uh, we should take courage and actually become aware that God remains near to us under these circumstances. But what he's calling us to do is to see him draw near in the dark and understand that he is offering uh, his forgiving love and forgiving power at an ever deeper level. And if we allow God's forgiving love to take full effect in us, in this respect, God is near. He's going to enable us to live in this, what shall I say? You know what I mean. Live in the state of the eclipse of God, the seeming absence of yeah. God, in such a way that by simply living our sonship, allowing God to father us under these conditions, we're engaged in atonement. I mean, hmm. in other words, this God is bringing, again, good out of the world. 
under these, these conditions have never been riper for the work of atonement, letting God draw near. But if he's going to draw near and enable his beloved to assert sonship against sin, that sin means its effects. And they, and those effects boil down to his seeming absence, it, it, a certain theological yeah. darkness, a theological exile. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? So I guess it's a call to pick up your, your, yes. your, 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 get to it, get to it. <laughs> Don't just be, bemoan the increasing secularism that, that we see, yeah. but, but right. recognize, gosh, come on, right. the, the universe is called yeah. a holiness, live it yes. out under these conditions. That's right. God's, that's yes. the pattern that's in play. Yes. Thanks. What I, what I call the uh, modernity's nullification of God, which is a far deeper eclipsing of God than simple denial of his existence, the nullification of his very, the, of the relevance of whether, of the question. But anyway, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Turek, Dr. Walker, for coming on today. Like I said, longest conversation I've had. Great. Uh, we'll see if my hard drive gets burned up as it processes this thing, but it won't, it'll be fine. And um, we'll have to do this again. And uh, Definitely. Because there's so much more in this book that we could talk about. Gosh. and uh, and go from there so thank you guys and i'm going to thanks uh, larry. excellent okay thank you very much thank, thank you very much larry and thanks okay, larry Margaret. thanks adrian oh my pleasure